Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, The Mind and Memory, answering your questions about cognitive aging, brain health, and the challenges of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Judging from the size of the audience tonight and the amount of registrants, obviously it's a topic that touches so many families and so many lives that uh, we're all sharing this tonight. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo. I'll be your moderator for this evening's webinar, which is presented by the University of Miami Health System, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Memory Disorders Clinic. The Memory Disorders Clinic provides compassionate care for individuals facing a wide variety of challenges and conditions related to memory. The center draws on the knowledge and experience of a multidisciplinary team of professionals at one of the country's leading academic medical centers. Because memory problems can have so many causes, the team takes a holistic approach to assessing, diagnosing, treating, and managing each individual. They know that every patient is different and their doctors are actively involved in leading edge clinical trials that may offer new options to their patients. So we invite you to learn more about UHealth's Memory Disorder Clinic by visiting umiamihealth.org slash psychiatry. Contact them to schedule a consult and call 305-243-0214. Don't worry, we're going to repeat that information again and have it up on your screen so you can take pictures and, and have it uh, in addition to the fact that this is being recorded tonight and you will be receiving it in your inbox at a later date. But tonight we're very excited and we're very privileged that we're going to hear from our memory disorders expert, Dr. Elizabeth Crocco. Now here are the topics she's going to explore. The differences between normal cognitive aging, mild cognitive impairment, and clinical dementia. The role of evidence-based brain biomarkers and cognitive tests that aid in the early diagnosis of cognitive disorders and their underlying brain disorders. The emerging agents currently used in the treatment and management of early Alzheimer's disease and the best practices in providing optimal care for those with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in later life. Now, at the end of the presentation, there's going to be a Q&A session, question and answer, which is a unique opportunity for all of you to ask direct questions of our expert. Please use the Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Take a moment to locate it on your device and enter your questions as you think of them. We're going to prepare them for Dr. Crocco to address, and we're going to do our best to have, have her field as many as we can in the hour we have. So now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Crocco. She's a clinical professor and chief of geriatric psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. As medical director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and Aging, she oversees the coordination of the Memory Disorder Clinic, all interdisciplinary teaching and community outreach for Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias in South Florida and extending to the Florida Keys. As clinician scientist serving the multi-ethnic population in South Florida, she's been central to her research to address health disparities with new initiatives to improve access to geriatric services for underserved populations. She also has a significant role in both developing and testing novel neuropsychological and functional measures developed to detect mild cognitive impairment leading to Alzheimer's dementia, as well as serving as primary investigator in multiple clinical trials aimed at modifying its symptoms and disease pathology. Dr. Crocco is the geriatric psychiatry training director at Jackson Memorial Hospital and facilitates the primary training and supervision of all geriatric psychiatric fellows, psychiatric residents, medical students, and other healthcare professionals in the field. A long and well-deserved introduction to say hello to Dr. Crocco. Well, I just want to say I am very pleased and very honored to be here today to be able to present. And I want to thank Ileana for also being here with that beautiful and very wonderful introduction for me. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So my first slide and the first part of my talk is really to focus on the fact that we are a changing population. And we are a population that is aging, okay? By 2030, one in every five residents will be at retirement age. Persons 85 and plus will triple and the country will add half a million centenarians. 
globally, the older population is showing a dramatic increase. Mm -hmm. And even though we are an age population and we are living longer, the question is, how do we want to spend those extra years that now that we're living longer? And it all depends upon the quality of the health that we have. So many of us here, you know, you know the drill. You know the drill, you know about prevention. You know is that as we enter middle age, we have to be very cautious in preventing high blood pressure in treating our high blood pressure, in treating the diabetes and losing weight when we get we, when we gain weight, in exercising, in controlling our cholesterol. And we do this so that we can have our cardiovascular risk, the risk to heart disease and stroke to prevent, because these are things that can lead to death and disability. But now in more recent years, we realize that optimization includes optimizing brain health. And to optimize our brain health, it's essential for successful aging. Reducing the risks of cognitive disorders like Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative related dementias that we see uh, in older age are as important at reducing hypertension to lower one's risk value, cardiovascular disease. So how do we do these things? Well, first thing we have to look at is we have to look at what are some of the risks associated with developing Alzheimer's disease and those related neurodegenerative disorders we see in older age. Many of those risk factors are very, very similar to the risk factors that we have to, um, uh, that can cause cardiovascular disease and stroke, right? So with some of the things that we mentioned, such as controlling hypertension, controlling cholesterol and our lipids when we have high lipids, uh, controlling diabetes, having special good dietary interventions that's focused on things like the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet, which overall, to simplify matters, is eating whole foods, eating colorful foods, such as foods that, that um, uh, are vegetables and, and, and fruits. Somebody has their... Okay, thank you. Um, so, and also, but but an additional additional things that are often seen as AD risk factors includes things such as excessive alcohol use or al You know, for many years I've heard this talk about how the Mediterranean diet and, for example, drinking things such as red wine is good for the diet and it's good for the brain. It's good for the heart because of some of the substances that come through fermentation of red wine. But the reality is that when you're drinking a lot of alcohol, this is a toxic substance that's not very good, not very good for the body, not very good for the liver, not very good for, the, for brain health. And it's something that needs to be limited. And in addition, patients who suffer from certain psychiatric conditions or, or emotional problems, such as depression and anxiety, can be a risk factor for Alzheimer's and related dementias. So. We have some predictors of risk. And when people who age have these problems that we're gonna talk about here, these are more likely to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease and these dementias. Number one is the duration and severity of cognitive impairment. When somebody has cognitive impairment that's sustained over time, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we talk about mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Extra pyramidal signs, that's a fancy terminology that talks about changes that occur in the brain that lead to things such as tremor, when somebody has ongoing tremor, stoop posture and difficulty walking, trouble walking and moving that's not related to things such as maybe hips or knees or back that may be more related to changes within the brain itself and slowing down in someone's movements and their handwriting. The vascular risk factors we talked about. Psychiatric illness is also a, ri a risk factor. And then genetics. And when you have a combination of any of these factors, that increases the risk 
of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. I do want to just briefly mention uh, genetic risks, the blood biomarker for something called APOE4, which is apolipoprotein E. This is a protein, this is the gene for a protein that we make that, that's part of our cells and it's part of our, ce our, um, our cell membrane. And since the 1990s, we this is one of the first biomarkers or, or first pieces of evidence that shows that if you have certain genetic APOE genes, which is called the APOE4, that it puts you at a greater risk to develop dementia, Alzheimer's dementia at an older age after 65. And so this is just a nice little chart that shows you that you inherit two genes. For um, You inherit one gene from your mother, you inherit a second gene from your father. And if you inherit two genes with that APOE4, you're 14 times more likely to go on after 65 to develop Alzheimer's disease. And this is, a, this is something that we can measure. And this is something, you know, you may have, there was a famous actor who went through, you know, one of these, one of these uh, commercialized uh, uh, blood bio, uh, uh, gene uh, um, sites that, that was able, found that he was an APOE4 and he was very concerned about it and he went very public on it. But these are the these are this is the most common gene that we see sporadically in people when they have a mother or father with Alzheimer's disease. So so that that's kind of you know it's the sad news. The good news is well, what can we do about these things when we're in middle age, right? What can we do? Well, unfortunately, genetic risk we can't change who our mother and father is, and we can't change what our genetic risk is. But recent re research demonstrates for us that you, there's probably enough wiggle room that you've got about a 35% chance of lowering your risk of Alzheimer's disease through potentially modifiable actions. And those are primarily lifestyle behaviors that we talked about, including getting control of your cardiovascular risk factors, being a healthy weight, exercising physically on a regular basis and eating a healthier diet, okay? So, so here are some of those things, you know, stopping smoking, controlling diabetes, eating the healthy diet. There's a couple of things that's different than the cardiovascular risks and, and preventative strategies that are promoted by our heart doctors and our stroke doctors. Number one is aggressively treating depression or psychiatric conditions. Very important to lower risk. Social engagement. We learned this many years ago, and it became very starkly obvious to us during the pandemic that as we age, those of us, evidence shows that are socially engaged in the community, in our families, in a complex way on a day-to-day -day basis and have friendships and social connectedness are much less likely to develop these neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. A hearing test, we've shown that when you start to lose your hearing in middle or later age, it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So it's probably smart to get those hearing exams at an early age. And also as somebody ages and they're starting to have cognitive impairment in general, the fact of the matter, if they, if they don't have optimal hearing, this could add to the problem. So early detection of individuals at risk for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias is really becoming more of a global priority. The understanding is that the early we re recognize you have the disease process and at the earliest phases of symptomatology, this is the best time for us to both clinically in the clinic at the Memory Disorder Center and also at the CNSA where I work, where as a clinical scientist, we come up with better ways to identify those who are at risk, those who have the disease, so we can develop better treatment regimens as early as possible. Makes sense. So I like this slide because it gives us, it, 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 it explains to uh, the community how when we have health conditions, that we make the effort 
to put in the investment to study, to learn about, to better diagnose and to better treat that we come up with real treatments that really make headway. And the reason I show this slide is it shows three types of disease diseases, heart disease, cancer, dementia, all very, very common, okay? And if you look at care versus NIH, how much it costs to take care of somebody with heart disease, cancer, and dementia versus how much the National Institute of Health and the federal government spends, and this is an old slide, this is about 10 years old, on an annual basis to try to look for better treatment regimens for these diseases and study them better. And you can see there's quite a disconnect here where you have heart disease at 3.75, cancer at seven, but dementia only at 1.68. And so the take home message here is, this is just as common as the other condition. It costs more for us to take care of these, these patients, these in the population. And if we could have better put funding into treating and, and finding better cures, we might be able to, to really find some disease modifying agents, very important. So now we're going to talk about what is normal cognitive aging. Well, we slow down as we get older, right? So as we age, it's very normal to have a general slowing of information processing. That really peaks at, at 30. We, have, we decrease our ability to formulate complex attentional tasks, such as divided attention, right? Being able to focus on two things at once. That's what we talk about is multitasking. It gets harder to do as we do. Selective attention, there's noise in the background and we're trying to focus on what somebody's saying, right? To listen to them, it's hard to focus. The working memory capacity, right? So the ability to on the fly, look at, look at a, um, a check and be able to calculate a tip quickly. So these things tend to slow down as we age. We also tend to slow down in our ability to lay down new memories, right? And our ability to, to retrieve information that are already there in our brain. And we, we kind of refer to those as senior moments, right? Where we're trying to think of something that just happened or a movie we saw, the name of an actor, and it just takes us a lot longer to come up with it, right? Those senior moments. So these are normal things that happen. But the take home message is that even though many of us but, you know, after 50, start to feel and have these issues, they are minor issues. They're not typically happening every day, all day, and they tend to not interfere with our ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. They tend to be minor. So many of you, if you haven't already heard, this is, this is a terminology that's been around for the last 25 to 30 years. There's a condition, a clinical condition known as mild cognitive impairment or MCI for short. So what is this and how is this different than normal aging? Um, you may have heard about it. You may have even talked to your physician or read about it. Well, this is when somebody subjectively, they, have, they feel like there's something wrong with their memory. Right? I don't feel like my memory or my cognition is as good as it was, right? I, I seem to be making mistakes, right? So they have a subject or their family member says, I think I noticed they make mistakes, right? But they function normally, right? They function, they, they generally function normally. They're cognitively normal. They have normal activities of daily living. They pay their bills. They go to their doctor's appointment. They drive, they travel, they manage their household, right? But when, when evaluated and tested, their memory seems to be not as good as other people of their age. But they're not impaired, right? They're not demented. They don't have dementia. They still function normally. But there's something about these people that tells us that this is somebody we want to watch, that this is not exactly the same thing as normal aging, okay? Okay. So why, are these, why is it important that we understand who these people are? Well, these are people, MCI patients, they, they do worse than normal subjects on some tests. And the primary distinction is typically in the measurement of memory. For most of these folk, it's really their memory that's worse, even for other people their age, that we see impairment. 
And, you know, when we evaluate patients, we look at a whole bunch of different cognitive domains. Memory is just one of them. And when we talk about memory, we're usually talking about the ability to, to learn, to lay down new memories, right? What's happened now? What happened yesterday? We're usually not talking about memories from 50 years ago, right? You know, how many times you, you had your, your, your mother, your father says to you, you know, your father's unbelievable. He can't remember what he had for breakfast, but he can remember what we ate when we went out with Mrs. So-and-so 50 years ago, right? So that's very typical in aging. You know, they remember those crystallized memories from many years ago, but it's really the day-to-day -day where you have they have the problems. They also may have language abilities, you know, coming up with words or communicating, visual spatial problems, getting lost, and then executive fun functioning, the ability to plan and, and carry out tasks. So MCI is important to us, and it's important to cognitive doctors like myself, cognitive researchers like myself, because sometimes mild cognitive impairment could be caused by a lot of things. Maybe it's because somebody's more depressed. Maybe it's because of some medications that, that the primary care doctor put them on. Maybe it's because they're very stressed out and they didn't do so well on the testing, right? But maybe it's a harbinger and maybe it's an early phase that's predictive that they're more at risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. And that's what we're concerned about because we want to know those people because we want to help the ones that we can reverse and we want to try our best to help reverse some of the problems before they go on to develop dementia for the ones at greater risk. Does everybody understand that? That's why it's so important as part of brain health and cognitive health as you age, that when you start to have these problems and they're a little worse than you would expect, or maybe they're a little, or maybe you have a family history, or maybe you know, you compare notes with your friend who's also 70 years old and maybe, and you feel like, well, maybe I'm having more problems and you're worried about it. You really should come in for an evaluation. These are, these are exactly the kind of people that we can do a lot to help. And, and the goal is to try to reverse some of that cognitive deficit, to delay progression for those at risk, to develop dementia and Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, and to delay the loss of functional ability so that they can be as productive as for as long as possible, right? You know, sometimes I'll say to patients, if I can make you more productive for two years, four years, five years, then it's worth it, right? It's worth it. That's what we want to see. We also, you know, we talk about managing people who have depression, anxiety, stress. That's a big part of it the environmental and lifestyle changes, you know? We talk a lot about, you know, the fact that, you know, okay, the quality of life as we age, we know we don't want heart disease. We know we gotta move, right? We have to walk. God forbid we, you know, we, we, we break a hip and then we stop walking and then we can't get out of a chair. We know that that's gonna cause us to ha not have a good old older age. And we wanna prevent those things and we wanna exercise and be able to get out of chairs and walks. But we also want to be able to have good brain health and cognitive functioning, right? And then finally, at a place like the UM Memory Disorder Clinic, we have state-of-the-art opportunities at, that we've been developing through research through people like Dr. Phil Harvey, functional and cognitive training that can be really helpful for people who have mild cognitive impairment. So I want to move on. So we talked about normal aging and cognition. We talked about mild cognitive impairment. So now we're going to talk about dementia. So we it's also referred to more recently as major neurocognitive disorder. So we had MCI, mild cognitive impairment. We used to refer to that as minor neurocognitive. This is dementia. This is a major neurocognitive. This is not normal aging. Well, if we get old enough, no. This is a disease process. And the, one of the number one questions I have family members and patients ask me is, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? I don't understand. Well, dementia, it's really, it's a syndrome. It's a series of problems that a patient has that can have lots and lots of different causes. It's not normal aging. 
Usually the person has cognitive impairment, okay? But they can have other things wrong with them. They can have other neurological symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, and functional symptoms. You most commonly see this in the elderly, okay? Because that's Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common form of dementia there is. And it's typically neurodegenerative in the elderly. But you can get dementia in a young person. You can have, if somebody has a severe head trauma, that can cause dementia. If a 45 year old man has a massive stroke, right? And it causes tremendous brain damage, that can cause dementia, right? But the, the, but the most common kinds of dementia are Alzheimer's and, and these other illnesses that degenerate over time and that are, that are, um, that are, uh, the elderly, uh, uh, that, that hit the elderly, okay? But they can have many different causes. So just very quickly, how does dementia differ than mild cognitive impairment or normal aging? It's all about how severe it is. And the main thing we look at as physicians is how they function with it. This really is causing an interference in their ability to manage their day-to-day -day functioning, right? And it's a decline from before, right? This is not something that somebody's been having for 20 years. This is something that's getting progressively worse, and it's a decline. It's not usually explained. If somebody has a psychiatric disorder like severe depression or bipolar illness at, or schizophrenia, and at the they're, you know, they're in the middle of an episode that's usually not dementia. That's usually they can have dysfunction because of a psychiatric disorder or an acute medical problem of which they're in the hospital and they're cognitively impaired, but then you know they get better and all of a sudden they're better. We call that a delirium, okay? So how do we physicians make this determination? We still make the determination of whether someone is demented through history and exam. So in order, there's no magic tests for this still. We still have to make this criteria based on the questions we ask you and the evaluation that we do, okay? And these are the certain cognitive and behavioral impairments that we have to be, for have to have a minimal of two of these, right? Impaired ability to acquire new information, impaired reasoning, and ability to handle complex tasks. So for example, you may have your mother who is a phenomenal cook, right? Phenomenal cook. And all of a sudden, she doesn't want to cook anymore. And when you encourage her to do so, she seems to struggle with the complexity of these phenomena. And she's kind of shortening the recipes. She's microwaving stuff. She's making, making shortcuts because she's really lost that ability to handle this complex thing that she did for a very long time. Same with computers, smartphones. You know, you may have a father who, who was fantastic with computers, worked, retired, and then all of a sudden he's struggling with computers. <laughs> activities that that basically he had no problem with a, a year or two before impaired visual spatial abilities right so this is when they get lost right so yeah I took my father on a cruise and I showed him how to get back to the cabin three times but he still kept getting lost kept getting lost right I don't want him to travel anymore because he's getting lost right so again, you see, these are the impairments that you see that you don't see with somebody who's normal aging or who has mild cognitive impairment. Impaired language function, and then they can have changes in their personality, behavior, or comportment. These four diseases that I have listed here are the most common causes of dementia in later life. Alzheimer's disease, vascular disease, diffuse Lewy body disease, and frontotemporal dementia. These are diseases that are common. These are diseases that are progressive over time. And these are diseases that you will come, when I talk about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, these are really the ones that we're talking about. The problem is that when a person is over 60, over 65, and they have dementia, the chance of it being potentially reversible is very low. Again, another reason why it's so important to practice good brain health before we get to this stage and to come in before you reach the stage for an evaluation, treatment, and whatnot. So this is the dementia workout that we traditionally do. Your primary care doctor couldn't do it, a neurologist out in the community, psychiatrist, or in the memory disorder clinic. We do 
cognitive psychometrics and neuropsychological testing. So those are the tests that can be on a computer or paper and pen where we ask you questions, right? And we test things like your memory and your cognition, right? We also do neuroimaging for a CAT scan or an MRI. We look at basic blood work to make sure there's nothing medical going on that could be causing this. And in some cases, we may do an EEG that measures um, brain activity that can be somewhat leading in telling us whether or not the brain is functioning as well as it should be. But we've really, so that's your basic workup that we've done for many, many, many years. But we've really had a lot of new stuff going on recently. And there's this thing called brain biomarkers. And this is particularly relevant. We have brain biomarkers for a number of these neurodegenerative disease, but I'm going to focus mostly on Alzheimer's disease because that's by far the most common. And that's the one that I you have done the you know most research with and, and scholarly activities. So, and it's the one I think most people are interested in. So over time, there's been a number of brain biomarkers. These are measurements. These are biological things that we can measure in your body that if a person comes and has those symptoms of dementia, that these are things that when we look at them and they're positive, they're, they're biomarkers that tell us that the chance of them having Alzheimer's disease is much higher. OK, they're not 100 percent diagnostic, and it's very important to understand that when these blood biomarkers are done is very important of when in the course of the disease the person has. So I have a lot of young people who come to me and they're like, you know, I'm 45 years old. My mother had Alzheimer's disease. Should I go through this? No, you're fine. Your symptoms, what you need to do is you need to do all the brain health stuff, right? You have to live your healthy life, make all those lifestyle changes. Don't get too worried about this yet, because this is more when the person starts to become symptomatic in that MCI level, right? So what are these brain biomarkers we have? Well, we have imaging. So we can look at an MRI and we can look at a structural MRI and we can talk, we can look at it and we can look and see if there's decreased brain volume into certain areas that we commonly would see in Alzheimer's disease. But in addition, we have something called PET scans. They're called positron emission tomography. They're kind of like a CAT scan. CAT scan is like a computerized X-ray in which we can inject the substance and we can measure different functionalities in your brain and take pictures of it and look for things in your brain that shouldn't be there. And those include things like beta amyloid, which is a protein, and tau, which is a protein. So these are two proteins that we commonly see in the brains of people who have a number of different illnesses, but particularly what we're going to focus on is Alzheimer's disease. So we now have a way to measure whether or not these things are in the brain. Okay, very important information. We also, for years, we've been trying to work on, is there any way we can do something easier? So for example, do a blood test. Well, for many years, we, we, we can look at cerebrus. We can do a lumbar uh, puncture or a spinal tap and look at the cerebrospinal fluid. And this tells us a lot of information, but a lot of, you know, people don't want to do that. They want a simple blood test. Well, the good news is we're getting better and better at developing blood tests to look at these protein fragments, such as beta amyloid, as well as tau and phosphorylated tau, to be able to better predict who is more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And some of these we use in our clinic and they've been very, very helpful and successful. So one of the things that's really unique about the UM Memory Disorder Clinic and the CNSA where I work, the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, is that we are neuroscientists that we develop these biomarkers. And we develop kind of really cool biomarkers. We develop cognitive biomarkers or biomarkers that are novel cognitive tests, paper and pen and computerized, which are very cheap and they're easy to do and I don't have to stick a needle in you, right? And these are basically, we call them cognitive stress tests. And I put the name of one of the cognitive stress tests that we use in the clinic that we developed with my colleagues, Dr. 
David Lowenstein and Dr. Rosie Curiel, the Lowenstein Aceveda Scales for Semantic Interference and Lewis. We, we affectionately call it the LASI. And these are somewhat different than the traditional neuropsychological tests that other memory disorder clinics or other doctors and clinics would use. We've referred to them as cognitive stress tests. It's kind of like stressing them. It's kind of like doing a cardiac stress test. And, and, and when we use these tests, they're designed to challenge the cognitive symptoms and have proven to be able to identify very subtle memory deficits among pre-symptomatic individuals that are not detected often in traditional cognitive measures, okay? So this is, this is very neat stuff that can actually help us to predict who's gonna go on to develop Alzheimer's disease and who's not, okay? So just sharing with you some of the really neat stuff that we have nowadays at our fingertips that we can use to better diagnose people in its earliest phases. Now, this is a very important slide. I'm moving on to patients who have dementia, patients who have care providers and family members. You know, one of the reasons I'm popular and my memory disorder center is possible is because we recognize that cognitive impairment is only part of the story. Many of these patients have emotional and behavioral symptoms. Data dating back to the 90, 80s and 90s tells us that a good 90% of patients with Alzheimer's disease and these types of dementias demonstrate emotional and behavioral problems. And there is a multitude of reasons why they do it. They do it because they know they're losing their memory and it's very frustrating for them. And they get very sad and, and they get easily irritated by it. They have difficulty coping with things. So it makes them angry and upset, right? And, 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 and it may trigger family responses that get them more anxious and upset and dynamically. It could be related directly to the brain, right? That these brain changes directly led to neuropsychiatric and psychiatric symptoms, right? It could be complexities because of medical problems that interact or medications that they're taking that interact with this, right? So there's so many reasons, but if you talk to anyone who's cared for a loved one who suffers from these dimensions, oftentimes this is the, one of the major problems that they have to deal with and that makes the patient suffer, right? And it's not just because they suffer emotionally. There are consequences when patients have these severe emotional and behavioral symptoms. When they do have them and they remain untreated, they're more likely to decline cognitively, they're more likely to decline functionally, and they're more likely to die quicker. So that's another reason why it's important to recognize this and to do what best we can to help them. So when we manage people with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, we have whole host. And this is one of the things that we're real good at. If you go to your primary care doctor, okay, they can do maybe one of these. If you go to a neurologist in the community, maybe they can do two of these. But when you go to a specialized memory disorder clinic like at UM, we manage all of these, okay? I had, I had a patient today, I'll tell you today. I had a patient today who was having a lot of problems, who has Alzheimer's disease. And his, his, the son said to me, after, the, after we fixed the problems and discussed it and came up with a plan, he said to me, you know, I took, I took, my, I took her to see a, this neurologist and that. Why don't you work with these neurologists? Why don't you work with these neurologists? Why don't they know what you know? And I said, well, I don't need them. Because I, I said, you should have come to me first. <laughs> I said, thank goodness you got here, right? Thank goodness you got here. So we have to manage all of these things. We have to manage, manage the cognitive side of things, the medical and neurological side of things, the psychiatric and behavioral, and of course, the caregiver issues, which is huge. So first thing, so I'm gonna, I, I wanna give you some, a little, a few very quick take home messages. It's important when somebody has dementia that you make sure that optimal medical care for all their medical problems. They often forget to take their medicines. They forget to go to doctors. Just by tuning this up and paying attention to make sure they get the proper treatment, they take their medicines can improve their symptoms, okay? Medications to avoid in the elderly. This could be, I can give you an hour talk, but I'm going to give the 30 second version. Okay. 
There's three medicines I want you to focus on, and you can be an advocate for your loved ones. Number one is something called anticholinergic medicines. These are medicines, often a lot of psychiatric medicines have them. These are medicines like Benadryl, diphenhydramine, oxybutynin, which we use for urinary incontinence. Those are medicines that really are a big no-no for people who have dementia. Sedative hypnotic, sleeping pills, Z drugs, benzodiazepines such as Xanax, Valium, lorazepam, and pain medicines. These are what I call the red flag drugs. Now, there are sometimes you have you have you know an elderly patient that they have to take them. They're in severe pain. They got to take opiates. It would be and you may not to give it, right? But these are the red flag drugs that can make these symptoms worse. Behavioral intervention, again, I'm going to give you the, the, the brief version. Non-pharmacological interventions are always first. You don't reach for the medicine because the medicines only do so much. You have to weigh the risks and benefits, and you only, I call them the big guns. You only take out the big medicines such as antipsychotics and benzos, which can help. And sometimes you have to use them. So Dr. Krakow, does my mother have to take this? Yes, the symptoms are severe and it helps, but you only do it in severe cases, okay? Medicines can only do so much. There's no magic medicine for the behavioral and psychiatric symptoms. Sometimes they stop working. Sometimes the risks are too great. And you can do behavioral life treatment much more. And in places like the Memory Disorder Clinic, part of that is to teach care providers how to individualize, how to talk to patients, how to work with them, okay, and education. The other part of this is oftentimes caregivers, they just don't know where to go. They don't know what the what, what's available out in the community at the state, federal, and local level. So memory disorder cl clinics can be very useful in guiding people to see what, what things that are available to them. What does Medicare cover? What can I do? How can I get respite care if I work full time, right? Is there a place that I can drop off my, you know, is there a daycare that you recommend? So that's really important. So I also want to talk about the new drugs that are available. But before I talk about the new drugs, I want to talk about the old drugs. So the old drugs are still there. These are FDA indicated drugs for many years. There are two types. They're cholinesterase inhibitors. That means that they build up a, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine in the brain. And there are NMDA antagonists, glutamate antagonists, okay? These drugs can be very effective and helpful. They are not a cure, unfortunately. They are not a drug that's going to reverse. They're not going to reverse the changes that are already made, but they can delay the progression moderately for some time. And they often can delay the onset of some behavioral symptoms. So they are very much worth looking into and taking. And they both have unique things that they do. Okay. Oftentimes, I'm just going to drop this one pearl, I see that many physicians were not cognitive specialists. They often opt for memantine, which is the NMDA antagonist, before the cholinesterase inhibitors. And you see this a lot in geriatrics. They opt for it because they feel it's safer and it's less likely to cause side effects. But that doesn't mean it's more efficacious. And it's very important that you don't give a drug just because it's safe. It's got to be efficacious too. And that's why cholinesterase inhibitors are usually the frontline drug because memantine is not indicated in mild Alzheimer's disease. I, I have here listed a whole lot of pharmacological approaches to patients with dementia. Antioxidants, NSAIDs, medical food, statins, menopausal hormonal therapy, and diabetes meds. I am here to tell you, they have looked at all of these and they've looked at them in dementia patients and they do not slow the progression, period. When you have dementia, these drugs are not gonna help. We do have new disease modifying drugs in the last year and a half that are now FDA approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's. They are called aducanumab and lecanumab. 
These are drugs that are anti-amyloid, beta amyloid. This is a protein that builds in the brain. This is one of the biomarkers we look at when we do PET scans and blood biomarkers. And it's been thought for the last 20 to 25 years that that's the leading reason and cause for Alzheimer's is the buildup of beta amyloid. And so these drugs have been developed for many years. They're anti-amyloid therapies. They're monoclonal antibodies that attack it in the brain and reduce it. And they've been shown to reduce it since the time of mouse models when we were just experimenting on mice. They do reduce beta amyloid in the brain. So there's a lot of hope, but it's cautious hope because a lot of the studies that the FDA has approved, you have to understand we've only looked at these drugs and the outcomes for short periods of time. We haven't looked at these drugs over three years, four years, five years, 10 years. And though although they have some promise here, there's still a lot of caution. They're very expensive. They are not pills. They're infusions and they have a lot of side effects potential side effects, I should say, including something called ARIA, which is amyloid-relating imaging abnormalities, and they may cause small microbleeds in the brain. So there's a lot more I can say about it. My hope is I'll be invited back to do more of a thorough understanding about this disease process and where we go from here. I do want to give my shout out to the University of Miami Memory Disorder Clinic that's been funded for over 25 years, that provides evaluations, that provides state-of-the-art biomarkers, the ability to enter into clinical trials and research that's state-of-the-art, and also to be able to manage and help care providers and patients manage their disease process, caregiver support, memory screens in the community, as well as helping silver alerts. And this is the team. Thank you, Dr. Krakow. Um, so thorough, so engaging, uh, have us all on the edge of our seat. You know, what's new? What's the latest? And a lot of the questions that are circling around since it's now time for our question and answer session and we've been bombarded is about the APO4 gene, the whole protein thing. Is this a routine test? Who should have it? Should I have it? Yeah. Should anybody have it? So this test has been available for, for many years. Um, if you do the, the, what is it, the 23andMe and these these kind of, um, you, you can actually, that's one of the tests that they do at these um, genetic, uh, these, these, these private industry companies where you can look at your background and, you know, look at your ethnicity and, and your genetics. They actually will do it and will give you the test results. You can actually order them and do these test results. The problem is nobody likes to, um, when you're very young, it's really not very helpful to get this test because it doesn't really help you. It is provided for now um, through, through Medicare, through CMS Medicare, it does provide. And what I use as a physician, I use it when I have patients who are more symptomatic or are more concerned about the earliest forms of symptoms because it better gives me an understanding what their risk is, right? And, and would because it young people should be less worried about their genetic risk, which they can't change, and more worried about the lifestyle changes. Got it. Does that make do, sense? Totally. Do what you can on yeah. your side and before you start getting tested for this. And I want to say one other thing, because it's very important. Just because you have the ApoE4 gene, that does no guarantee that you're going to have it. This isn't a gene, oh my God, I have it, I'm going to get it. No, it's just a much greater risk of increase. But that doesn't mean everybody's going to get it who has okay. ApoE4. It's right. very important for you guys to understand that. Thank you. That clarified because a lot of the people ask that question. Okay, now let's launch into psychiatric medications that so many people are on, mood stabilizers, antidepressants. And while I'm on the drug thing, let's also talk about the cholesterol medications such as the statins. Are all of these bad? No. For disorder? <laughs> no. So, so obviously when you're prescribed a medicine that's there's got to be a very good reason for your medicine. There's a risk benefit profile. We hope you're going to get a lot more benefit than risk. Otherwise you shouldn't be taking the medicine. So what, so, so when you look at psychiatric meds, you got to look at the ones, the one that got the most press, okay, 
is anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, and medicines such as benzodiazepines or sedatives. That a number of years ago, that got a lot of press because there was some population-based data that showed people who were taking those sedatives like benzodiazepines were more likely to have Alzheimer's. So it got everybody fearful that maybe it causes Alzheimer's. That is not true. That's been since shown not to be true. These drugs are not causing Alzheimer's disease. They're not causing dementia. However, when you look at sedatives, when you look at anticonvulsants, they do slow you down cognitively. There's no question that when you're on them, they will slow you down cognitively. And it's something that you have to weigh in your risk benefit profile, especially as you get older, right? That you may not be able to take these medicines at all unless they're really for a condition that you need help with. Make sense? Does. And we're going to try and get through the questions as fast as we can because um, there are a few. How about the supplements? Are there any supplements such as this Prevagen commercial, which we're bombarded with on television, yeah. that will help uh, brain cognition? So, other than taking a multivitamin, really supplements, they should be based on some evidence whereby you need them as an individual. So, if your doctor says to you, you have low vitamin D, you got to take vitamin D. You, you, you have brain, you, you, you know, you have bone issues that you should take calcium. You have a low B12 that you need to take that. And then, but other than a multivitamin, really, there's no really big reason. There's no great big evidence that tells you that these drugs are really going to be disease modifying for you and prevent these these illnesses. It's a billion dollar market with a lot of questionable science. What's more important is for you to exercise and eat healthy and maintain a regular weight. That is so much more important than supplements. And the population, our Hispanic population, I know is unusually higher incidence of Alzheimer's and uh, memory disorders. Is that, again, why? What's the reason? So that's another great question. We don't know fully what the reason is there. We all, you know, you could also add in also, we know that about African-Americans that there's a higher incident, even, even more so. So one of the biggest theories behind this is cardiovascular risk, right? So again, that they have more likely to have cardiovascular risks such as hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, right? Be, right? So again, for Hispanics and African-Americans, it's even more important for them to practice these guidelines early. And again, you know, a lot of times I'll see people in their middle age and I'll say to them, I am your wake up call in middle age. It's time. We still got time, right? Even at 60, you still got time, right? So we want to tune those things up. A lot of the questions are um, someone who's in their 70s. Here's a 74 year old man who says he's uh, starting to to notice a change of loss of memory uh, and concerns that because their relatives, their first line relatives, mother, father, et cetera, had dementia, yes. does that mean that they're naturally going to get it? Well, I, I think a lot of that also depends upon how they're feeling themselves. Are they feeling great? Do they have no memory problems? You know, I, I do have patients who come to the clinic who come to me just like that part that 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 70 year old where they had a family history you know they've they've read about brain health they go to their cardiologist they go to their primary care they're taking care of all those aspects but they want to come to the oh, let me come and get a brain checkup right should i get evaluated i know that my memory's you know not i'm 70 i can see a difference from when i'm 40 right because this is normal so Sometimes I have patients come to get that baseline testing to see, and sometimes that's a wise thing to do, particularly if you want to be proactive. And is it because you start seeing the changes in yourself or because you're concerned about your family history? What's the smartest? I road? think if you have both, you definitely should come and get an evaluation. But I think I, you know, I like to say people who are proactive, I think it's a good idea, particularly if you're over 65. Let's talk about the hearing loss one, because I have read this before. Yes. Uh, hearing loss can lead to cognitive impairment. And there are yes. a lot of people with hearing loss. That's another billion dollar market. Talk about that. 
So that has been shown to be a risk factor as, as early as middle age, okay? So we're not just talking about over 65, 40s and 50s. It's absolutely something that, you know, if somebody feels like their hearing is not as good, you need a hearing evaluation. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like wearing hearing aids. They feel like it makes them look old. And But, but it has been shown that this is a big risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And even on top of that, if somebody already has MCI or, or dementia and their hearing's going and you don't take them to, to, to have the proper hearing aids, you know, it's going to make their cognition worse, right? Oftentimes it's going to make their cognition worse. So getting a hearing exam, we're even recommending now in middle age, particularly if somebody's been shouting at you or you're saying what, and your, your wife, your husband, your kids are saying to you, you know, dad, I think you should get your hearing check. It's time. You should get your hearing check. Dr. Krakow, um, from all the families and people that you meet, um, do you come to the conclusion that maybe we are not good observers of our own cognitive decline, are we? So that is a great question. That's one of my favorite questions. I'll tell you why. Because in the old days, 30 years, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and still some doctors today, they used the way that they would measure, if somebody came in and they were over 65 and they said, doc, I feel that my memory is not as good as it was. That was often seen as, as a sign that they were fine, that it was normal aging, because the idea was if you had early Alzheimer's disease, if you had dementia, you didn't have the insight. It was usually your family who brought you in and said, no, I see problems. And that, so that is true. There are some people who don't have the insight and it's the family, but there is a significant number of patients that early on have insight. So you do have to listen to that inner, that inside you that says, you know, I feel like something's not right. Sometimes they are better at picking it up early than their family. So that's some, you have to listen to that. Um, I, I'd like to run over a couple minutes just because it's, there's so much good information, uh, lack of good sleep or sleep apnea, all of those sleep disorders can also lead to cognitive decline. Absolutely. And also again, remembering what I said about mild cognitive impairment, that is, you know, so that, that is the time when we really want to live our best lives. And so if you have sleep apnea, if you're having bad sleep disorders and you have mild cognitive impairment, this is, could be very, you know, fixable. This could be something that could be helped. That's why it's important to do, to practice good sleep hygiene, get the help you need if you're suffering insomnia. And if you have sleep apnea, getting the treatment you need, because this could be the difference in improving your cognition when you have mild cognitive impairment. It's such a catch 22 doctor, because you just said, get good sleep. And some people say, I have to take the sleeping pills. If I don't take the sleeping pills, I won't sleep. And yet it's a bad thing. Well, or that that's a whole other hour talk. I'm going to say it in 15 seconds. We have data, even if you're a chronic insomniac for 35 years, that behavior modification and sleep hygiene and sleep behavioral cognitive therapy is more powerful than any medicine you will take and works. People prefer a pill. Yeah, I know. Better to do it that way. And stress is another factor. And you're right. We have, you know, we're now over. So I just want you to do a wrap up and uh, we thank you because you have been so generous with your time. And this is so important for the hundreds of people who are tuned in for us tonight and the millions uh, worldwide. What's your wrap up message for all of us? So my wrap up message is that, the, you know, when you're young and then getting middle aged, if you're worried about this, don't go out looking at genetics. That's not the time. The time is to tune up your health, your heart. What's good for your heart is good for your head. Practice mindfulness when you're stressed. Sleep better. Do everything you can to take care of your health and those lifestyle changes. As you get older, if you start to worry about your memory, particularly if you have family history or any of the other risk factors we talked about, 
come and get an evaluation. Don't put it off. Don't be afraid. I think a lot of people are afraid that, oh my God, the doctor is going to tell me I have Alzheimer's. They're going to tell me I have dementia. Well, you know, you go to a cardiologist and you don't say, I'm afraid to go to a cardiologist because he's going to tell me my heart doesn't work. No, you go to a cardiologist, but you want to help and you want to live your best life, right? It's the same concept. We want to live the best lives we can. So don't be afraid to come for that evaluation. You will be pleasantly surprised at how much we can help. That's one of my big take-home messages. Thank I you. Also, Did you want to add something? Go ahead. And I want to just give a shout out to the CNSA. We have tons and tons of clinical research that we do, longitudinal research, where we're very interested in people over 60. And we're very interested in studying people over 60. Not a lot of people are. And so anytime people, we, I want to give a big shout out to all our volunteers who volunteer in the research we do. Well, thank you again for uh, the privilege of your time. Uh, we're so grateful to you, Dr. Elizabeth Krakow, um, whom all of you have listened tonight. And thank you to our audience for being interactive and hanging in there with us. Um, we'd like to say from the University of Miami Health System that we are thankful to you. We invite you to go to umiamihealth.org slash psychiatry, get more information. Call 305-243-0214 to make an appointment. You have your call to action from Dr. Krakow. If you're concerned, don't just sit on it because denial is not going to help us. Please fill out the survey at the end. And thank you again. Have a wonderful night and please stay healthy, everyone. Good night, Dr. Krakow. Good night.